today's lecture. Again, I'm Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Education at UW-Whitewater. And for those of you who are in the room, you hear this every single time. Those <laughs> online might not, but we have hosted the Fairhaven Lecture Series here at Fairhaven Senior Services since 1983. Um, and so we're happy to be back here in person this fall, and we'll be back in person this spring. Today's lecture, we're going to uh, talk with one of our faculty members from our College of Education. Dr. Amy Stevens teaches courses in the science of reading, characteristics of learning disabilities, and methods for teaching. She is the chair of the Department of Special Education. In 2013, she went to Jamaica for the first time to explore a partnership with schools in Manchester Parish. Since that trip, she has coordinated seven trips for students to complete five weeks of student teaching in communities such as Mandeville and Mile Gully. In 2014, she collaborated with Church Teachers College to host the first special education conference and workshop to provide professional development for Jamaican teachers. This conference has grown from 80 participants its first year to over 600. Dr. Stevens is honored to be named the John Rufus Williams Lecturer by the Jamaican John Rufus Williams Educational Trust. She is counting down the COVID days until she can return with another group of student teachers. Dr. Stevens has two daughters and a very naughty dog. You can find her at all of the Janesville Jets hockey games, kayaking, riding her bicycle, and digging in her flower beds. Please welcome Dr. Amy Stevens. I'm so honored to be, is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. I'm so honored to be invited to do this talk with you all and talk to you about something that's very near and dear to my heart. My um, friends in Jamaica used to say that I was Jamaican, and now they just say I'm Jamaican. So I um, stick out like a sore thumb where I go, though, in Jamaica. So I, um, I grew up in Germany, so I have experience living abroad. And I was very blessed in, must have been 2012, to have somebody chase me down in the parking lot at uh, Winther Hall at UW-Whitewater. And... Um, this, uh, this faculty person was retiring and she grabbed me and she said, I need somebody to take over this Jamaica program and somebody brought up your name. And so I wanna ask you if you wanna do this. And you know, what was I gonna do except say yes, right? Without even knowing what I was getting into. So they allowed me to go over in summer of 2013 and um, I took a tour of a bunch of colleges in the area and went to many, many public schools and um, found my people, found my people that I wanted to work with. And um, since then, I've been bringing students. Sometimes um, it's a small group. I think the fewest I've ever brought has been three at once, but usually it is around nine or 10, but I've had as many as 18 go with me. So um, it's a great experience. So why would I want to do this? Well, I feel this is important having grown up abroad and knowing how it, it really um, made me who I am. Being, yes? Oh, yep, sorry. There we go. Nope, I need, I need that direction. I'm not used to, used to holding one up without a mask. My voice projects, so I don't usually use one. Um, so I feel that it's important that we all become citizens of the world and not just a citizen of Wisconsin or a citizen of the United States of America. And the reality is that for many of our students, um, having an opportunity while they're a student may be the only opportunity that they get to go abroad. And so it's, it's important for them to have that experience. So um, we know that culturally competent teachers are more effective in the classroom. They're better able to connect with all the kids that they teach. But uh, in Wisconsin and Northern Illinois, we lack diversity. Many of our students at Whitewater um, are coming from rural areas where, you know, Caucasian is all that they've seen as they've grown up, unless they've maybe gone into Milwaukee or down to Beloit. So it's, um, it's important that they develop a level of cultural competence that they aren't able to get when they're in a uh, very monocultural environment. Um, it's important because without it, we can be well-read, but until you're actually somewhere else and there for a long period of time, 
you have a naive view of that culture. So the, the more experience these students have and the longer they're able to stay in a different culture, the better off they are in the future in meeting the needs of all the students in their classroom. Okay, so, you know, and the, the bottom line is that to have cultural competence decreases your chance of um, having discriminatory behavior towards others. And, and as educators, we really need to be able to connect with the students in our classroom. So um, what better way to push students outside of their comfort zone except to go to a place where they look different than the kids they're going to work with and the rest of the people in the community. They sound different. You know, Jamaicans, when they go to school, they start speaking Jamaican proper English, but um, in their casual conversations, especially up in the mountains, they speak Patois. So um, it's even when the, the kids are speaking Jamaican proper English, the accent's very different than ours. And so it pushes our students to have to stretch beyond, um, I can't understand what they say, you know, as they would do with maybe a, a professor that's from a foreign country, to now the onus is on them. How can they make themselves understandable and how can they make sure that they understand others? So, um, you know, again, in Jamaica, we look very different from the people that we're living with and the places that we're going. Um, there's linguistic diversity that's going on and it's the difference between, be, between being a developed country and going to a developing nation that has very different needs, very different um, ways of transportation, um, different ways of getting their food and their daily needs met. So, Kwape and Cantatore in 2005 proposed four, four levels of cultural assimilation. And um, for a few years, I have had my students take their, they have a, um, a cultural awareness exam that students can take. So I had my students take it before they went to Jamaica and after they returned so that they could explore for themselves how the experience has helped them grow over time. I haven't been able to do this the last few times that I've gone because they've been in uh, revision for this test. So I'm hoping that by the time 2023 rolls around and I go back to Jamaica again, that I'll be able to um, have this reinstituted. But um, the first stage is the parochial stage, and that's the my way is the right way stage. So these are the people that, um, that really think that the way that Americans do it and the way that they do things is the only way that things should be done. So they tend to be um, a bit judgmental and they tend to be a, a little bit closed-minded when presented with others that come from elsewhere. And it's not that they're, they're you know, bad people, it's that they just haven't been exposed. So that's the first stage. The second, the second stage is the ethnocentric stage and that's the stage of, um, you know, I know that they have their ways of doing things but my way is still better, okay? So they're at least becoming aware at this stage that there isn't just one way to get things done, but they still think that their way is the way that, um, that it should be. Okay. So those first two stages are often what we see when um, individuals have not been to other cultures and have not taken the time to, to push themselves out of their cu uh, cultural zone and their comfort zone. The third stage, which is where I really hope that my students are when they return from their five-week experience, is the my way and their way stage. And at this stage, awareness is increased and they, they are even more aware that there are other ways to carry out activities, actions, way of life, ways of teaching, ways of reaching students, but um, those could be equally as valuable as what they have been taught to do. Okay? Um, it's, it's an interesting position when the students hit that point and almost every student has a defining moment um, from what I've observed in Jamaica where they have been at two at the ethnocentric stage and then something happens within the school and I'll talk a little bit about that later what, what the something often is and um, when these certain things happen we take the teachable moment and we spend a lot of time as a group debriefing. And in that conversation, they're able to really evaluate um, and start questioning, 
is this, is the way I do it the only way? Is it the right way? Um, it's very enlightening for them, too, when they hear that there are other areas of the United States that might handle situations differently than they would in Wisconsin or northern Illinois. Um, I think that's a real enlightening moment for them when they hear that not all of the United States has the same um, social mores and customs that we have in this area. Okay, And then the final stage would be the participatory third culture. This is when you have such a deep awareness that there's another culture and a, such a curiosity about it that when something um, occurs and it might get your hackles up because it's very different from your familiar, instead of jumping into the, um, is it my way better or their way better, instead you jump into the why. Why does this happen? How did it get here? What's, what's occurred over the history of this culture that's led to them getting to this point um, in the world? And having dialogues with people and by having those dialogues, really coming up with a, a third culture where not only am I learning or the students learning, but the people that we're working with are also learning as well. So it allows both of our cultures to shift a little bit and our knowledge bases to shift. So that would be the, you know, the holy grail that we would want to see. Um, but five weeks, for some students, that's not enough time. Some students go, um, go over to Jamaica with me, and they have a long road to go down to get to this point. So if they come back at the synergetic stage, I'm pretty happy with where they are. So as I've gone and taken students to Jamaica, I've, I've kept the action research questions in my mind. What can teacher candidates learn from international student teaching that will apply to their futures as teachers in the United States? Okay, so that's the first one. And the second, does international student teaching result in value changes? Okay, does it change their cultural belief system? And it, does it change their practices? So those are my broad questions that I usually go over thinking about and looking to see if this happens. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the program now and give you some of the fun stuff before, uh, before I share a little bit about how things have played out when I've done this pre-test, post-test. So the program, um, this program, I can take just about any student teacher. It's one of the benefits of this program. I teach in the special ed program, but um, Historically, it's probably been more of uh, physical education or adaptive physical education teachers that have gone than anybody, which is an amazing opportunity for them because they don't have a field experience where they're working with individuals that are very different from themselves, not even individuals with disabilities. And the adaptive PE license specifically pertains to working with kids that have disabilities. We've also had kids that, um, students in the early childhood program. We've had a lot of elementary ed teachers. Um, I've had secondary math and secondary language arts teachers. Um, and I think I had a secondary science teacher once. I haven't had uh, history and social studies yet, but hopefully I'll get one of them at some point in time as well. And then special education students. This is a four to, five, four to six week experience. It usually hovers about five weeks. And again, we are in uh, Mandeville and Mild Gully. So if you imagine Jamaica being about the shape of my hand, we're talking about right here. So they're up in the mountains. They're not doing what I call Jamaica, which is Negril, Runaway Bay, all the tourist areas. They are out in the actual Jamaican communities where really we're usually the only Caucasians that are seen within the town. Um, it's really kind of interesting. My first few years that I uh, went there, I would actually get stopped and asked to have my autograph because I was, for some of these people, the only white person that they had ever seen. So I always thought that that was a little bit entertaining that I was, a, I was uh, famous over there or something. I don't know. Um, so Mild Gully is a very rural town. It's small. It's a very small uh, town, um, small, a lot smaller than Whitewater. And Mandeville is a larger city, uh, more around the size of, um, of Madison. Okay, so they get to see these two extremes in close proximity. We live in Mandeville at Church Teachers College, um, but then most of the students have their, their placements for student teaching out in Mile Gully, although I do use some schools within uh, Mandeville itself. 
And it happens in, in January. I call it Jamaica January for me. It's amazing. <laughs> I've, I'm crying. I'm crying already because this is my second year in a row that I will not have gone to Jamaica in January, and I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. Okay. So what I do is I am kind of the, the maker of everything. I'm the tour guide. I'm travel mom. You name it, I, I fall into that role. So I plan an experience for them where we arrive in Jamaica and we start with the typical tourist experiences. So they get that controlled view of Jamaica as a tourist might get, um, get to see Jamaica. Then we go on school tours. So any school where I'm placing a student teacher, we all hop on a bus on the first Monday and we go to every single school. This allows the students to see the vast differences in the schools, just like we have in the United States. I did my um, public school teaching in Fort Worth, Texas, in, uh, so it was inner city. And um, I assumed that my district represented most inner city districts until I moved up to Wisconsin and I supervised student teachers in Racine. So I thought I was going home to similar sorts of buildings. Oh my gosh, the teachers in Racine, they had the nicest facilities in comparison to, to my classroom, which was half of the auditorium balcony with a leaky, ce with a leaky ceiling. Um, so I, uh, I thought that was pretty amazing. Same thing happens in Jamaica. We've got schools that are very affluent and have the best of resources, but there are many, many schools that have very few resources and are working with um, really much less than ideal that we would want for the kids. So the to school tour allows the students to see these differences and to see the differences in how the kids behave from school to school. Because again, just as in America, you can go to one school that um, really has a culture of orderliness and kindness to others, and you can go to another school that is more chaotic, that maybe has more discipline issues. Same thing over there. So after we do the school tour, um, this, the students start their student teaching experience. And as they do that, we start having cultural community experiences as well. So we do things like um, we go to a church service. Um, many Jamaicans are um, Moravian. And so we go to a Moravian church, and they get to see the difference in the architecture and how they, they hold their service. They also get to see within that Moravian experience that it's very similar to Catholicism or Lutheranism. There's a lot of parallels. So that, that um, you know, awakens them a little bit. Um, that's an important experience for them because while we practice um, the freedom to choose what religion or no religion to practice in the United States, in Jamaica, religion is central to who they are as a people. Um, this, every public school starts the day with prayer. And um, it's, the, it's really the center of their community and, and who they are. So it's important that our students understand that. And then as they're doing these community experiences, they're also immersing themselves in teaching. And then we spend a lot of time on group process, group process and individual process. Um, you know, it, my job starts when they get back from their school day, even though I'm out, out and about in the schools during the day, because it's usually a steady stream of, you know, one or three students coming in wanting to talk about what they saw that day. And, you know, some of the things disturb them because it's not how they've been trained here. But again, this is how they start shifting where they are in that um, rank order of uh, cultural awareness. watch my time here. So tourist experiences. So we start with about three days of tourist experiences. And um, then we do tourist experiences every weekend that I'm there. I tend to leave so that they have a good week and a half, two weeks on their own. So they, they get that part of the experience as well. But while I'm there, I make sure that we're taking advantage of everything we possibly can. So I just give you some fun examples here. So the picture on the, on the top left here is um, at Appleton Estates, which is a rum company, Appleton, Appleton Rum. And um, you can go to the Appleton Estates, and they will take you through the whole process historically of how rum has been made. So um, the two gals right there are pushing a machine that squishes the sugar cane and juices 
pulls the sugar juice out of the cane, um, they're playing the role of mules because that's done, that was done historically by mules. Um, so that's one experience. You'll see up on the upper right, uh, we go into to Kingston. And when we're in Kingston, we always take a pilgrimage to Bob Marley's home because, you know, you can't go to Jamaica without going and, and learning about Bob Marley. So that's the group of, one of my groups with uh, the statue of Bob Marley. That's his house right behind there. Um, what's nice about this experience is that there is a tour guide there that's actually from Mile Gully. So they get to start seeing how uh, Jamaica is a small community. It's not, you know, it's smaller than Wisconsin. So people know each other just about wherever you go. Um, down on the lower left, um, we go zip lining across waterfalls, and the right is the waterfalls as well. So um, it, we go to Wise Falls. We always go to Wise Falls, um, and then sometimes we go to Dunn's River Fall as well. Uh, very different experiences. Wise Falls is more of a Jamaican cultural experience, I think, because it's not as touristy. So when you go to Wise Falls, um, you see more locals that are there than you would see tourists. Every once in a while, you'll see a group of um, people coming from a cruise trip, um, coming a cruise ship coming through. But for the most part, it's it's more locals that are that are there. Um, Dunn's River Falls, if we can squeeze that in, we um, will go out to that side of the island, and that actually is one huge waterfall. It is. Um, it's hooked up to a, a docking, uh, a dock, so that lots of ships bring um, their, their pas passengers to Dunn's River Falls. And um, at Dunn's, they're able to do the activity where they link hands and climb up the waterfall, linking hands. Um, and they also get the experience of really the true Jamaican tourist sort of experience where when you leave Dunn's River Falls, you have to walk through a community of craft salespeople. And they're different than in America. I hear some laughs that some people have probably experienced that where um, you go through and these, these shop owners or keepers are coming out to you and trying to put objects in your hand because they know if the object gets in your hand, you've got a much greater chance that you're going to give them money. And that's how, that's how they make their living. So um, I warn them and try to prep them in advance, but there's always one or two students that come out with some really, really hideous looking uh, sculptures and, um, and things like that. Um, you know, they, they just get pulled into it because they don't know. That's not how we handle things in the United States. So then we have a fantastic conversation about how this isn't wrong, that this is how they handle their business. This is what they need to do in order to gain their business and to make their money. It's just different. So, so that experience often pulls them up to that, that, you know, number two of they're there, maybe my way is best, but I can see that they have cultural differences. And then some of them that are a little more advanced can move into the, okay, I can really see with so many shops why they would have to get out and really approach the customer rather than standing at the back and hoping that somebody walks into their shop. Um, and then the gal in the middle, she um, is eating her first red snapper, I believe it is. And for most of the students, it's their first experience um, we, we go to an outdoor, it's really like, a, it's their version of a drive-thru, uh, you know, an old world drive-thru. It's a place on the side of the road where there are about 20 shops, all of them prepping the same thing. All of them are selling bami, which is a sort of bread, and they're selling um, snapper and a few other things. And, um, you know, you go to the person that you know. And if you go up there and you don't know anyone and they don't recognize you, you're going to have about five people swarm down on your car trying to sell you um, what they're making. And um, if you're there just as an American tourist, you're going to get the smallest and the oldest of the fish that's being sold. And if you're there and you're somebody they recognize and maybe you have what I call a cultural broker with you, um, you're going to, that's going to go and approach somebody he knows or she knows, you're going to get a fantastic fish like, like what she had. So the students are encouraged to try the fish. They're usually creeped out. 
I've got some fantastic pictures of students plugging their nose as they're trying to, you know, take a bite of this fish with the eyeball staring back at them. So, but it's it's a good stretch for them to see that um, this is this is the food that they're eating when they go and buy fish at the market, but it's just been deheaded and you know, um, and prepped a little bit differently. So lots of different tourist experiences. This is part of their education before we go. The students have to research what's available on the island, and they have to propose to me what they want to do when they're there. Now, I've got enough times now that I can predict a lot of what's going to happen and what's going to be um, selected. But sometimes they surprise me. Um, I had one year where they really wanted to go to a coffee plantation, which was fantastic because I had wanted to go to a coffee plantation, but nobody had suggested that. And they did the work. They found the plantation. They contacted the owner and made sure that we could um, we could go up into the Blue Mountains and, and go see this, uh, this place where this man had made his home and, and had a business going on. Um, so every year, there seems to be a little something new that I get to do, too, as far as the tourist piece. And again, as we're doing those tourist experiences, we're having a lot of conversation about, is this the real Jamaica? You know, or, or is this what typical Jamaicans experience day to day? Or are there differences, what we're experiencing when we're out in these, these tourist places as compared to what they're experiencing when we're home in Mandeville? I mentioned that we go on the school tours, so this is, these are just a couple experiences. Uh, I put the picture of the windows up on the right because it always amazes the students that the Jamaican schools don't have glass windows. They have these slatted shutters that they just keep open. So their classrooms are much louder and noisier than American classrooms are. Um, Many of the schools, when I started, had tin roofs. That's been pretty much changed in the last seven, seven years. Um, many of the schools are one-room schoolhouses. They're large. They could be about the size of this room, but be a one-room schoolhouse that just has partitions up. Although I'm noticing the last year or two that many of those schools now have walls up as well. So we're seeing some, some differences um, in how they're pushing their education to set up a learning environment that's able to block out um, some, some things that go on in the world that would be distracting to learning. So it's, it's neat to see those changes. The picture of the whole group there on the bottom right, that um, the yellow building behind them on, I guess it's the left side of the picture, that's one of about seven special education schools on the island. So in Jamaica, well in America, if a child has a disability, they're typically taught in the school that's within their community. And many, most of the time now, they spend at least a portion of the day in a general education classroom. And then they'll be pulled out to get additional support if they need it. In Jamaica, the only special education we see in most schools is, um, or most communities, is that for kids with more severe disabilities. And for those kids, um, if they're lucky enough, they get selected to go to the special needs school. Otherwise, um, many times they just get shut out of education, which you know is, is really a sad thing. So the school that's on the left there, it had two classrooms and it served probably 30, 30 kids that had intellectual disabilities. It was quite packed. So we're outside with all the kids because we couldn't go into the classrooms there. It was too, it was too cramped. Um, the lower left, you see a room there with books. Um, that is a rare library in a school. Most schools over there in uh, the rural areas don't have libraries, but I've been working with teachers here in the United States to bring over books. Every time I go, the rule is I bring all my clothes and my carry-on, and my two checked bags are all books, and then any student that has um, a bag with less, less than 50 pounds in it, they have to stick books in their bag, too, and take it up to the, to the maximum. So every time I go, I'm able to bring the equivalent of probably four or five five suitcases of books for their library. Um, that was an interesting experience. The first couple years I did this, I noticed um, that the books weren't being used. And so we had to have a conversation. And they so revered the fact that they had a library in their school that they didn't want the kids to take the books. 
So we had to work with them and, and help them understand that as long as I'm coming, more books are coming. And I would rather, and they were concerned because they said a lot of the books won't come back because the kids don't have books at home. And, and I, you know, said, I would rather have the books disappear and get read than to have them sit in a room and not get used at all. So um, now that when I go back, I can go into classrooms and every desk has, every, every desk that a child is at has a book, a novel that they're reading, which I think is fantastic. So a good example of the mirroring of the cultures, you know, figuring out how you're going to make it work for them um, and, and uh, how we can get the, the information that the kids need that we both agree upon that the kids need. So again, we've got our community experiences too. So in the community, the center there, that's, um, that's, the Bethel, that's Bethel Moravian Church. That's the picture at the, at the front looking out to the back of the church. What you can't see in that picture is that the sides are completely open. So it's really more like a pavilion that they have for their church. It's, it's just a really stunning place. The picture doesn't do it, um, do it justice. But they, they participate in that church. Somebody from our group always gets to get up and give greeting to the parishioners. Um, the, the people at the church just welcome everybody and uh, want, to, want to stay in touch with them. Um, up on the upper left, that's a picture of when we were at the coffee plantation. We're, we're getting to examine the different grades of coffee beans there and to learn about um, how their texture is different and how they taste different and how they sort them. And then, uh, you know, looking into becoming more acculturated on the upper right, whenever I can, I try to pull a group of students, Jamaican high school students, and we take them to lunch so that there can be conversation. They can talk to people that are going to, you know, be American teachers who really aren't that different in age from them. And um, our students can actually get a look before they start teaching at who are these kids? What are their interests? What are the things they like to do? On the lower right, those um, are wares at the open market. We always take the students to the open market, and that's where most of us end up buying our groceries. So it is a, um, a barter market. It's a big open area that, you know, again, similar to what you see at Duns River Falls, the people that are selling come out and try to um, get you to buy from them as opposed to one of the other 10 stands that's selling pineapples or eggs. Um, but it's a great experience for them because... I've gone enough times now that the women that are manning most of the, the stands, they will actually come out and they will um, come up and tug on a purse of somebody in the group if they haven't listened to me and they haven't, you know, turned their purse uh, backwards and crossed it over their body and have their hand on it. They will come out and, and give them a little startle, but they're doing it to educate them. And then they, they will explain why they need to be more aware of themselves than they are when they're in America and about the risks that because they're, they're white and they're standing out and that makes them easily targeted as tourists. Um, why they need to do these extra things to protect themselves. So it's very enlightening to them with that. Every group, I find it interesting, every group that goes finds different shop owners that they really connect with. Um, and they develop relationships and go back to that same stand over and over again to buy their food. And if that stand doesn't have it, they'll say, well, you go to my friend Mary over here and she'll, she'll get you what you need. Um, the center is typical Jamaican meal. So it's um, the rice and peas. They don't say rice and beans. It's rice and peas. And it's usually gungo peas or pigeon peas as opposed to the beans we see in uh, red beans and rice if we're going down to Louisiana here. Um, the green isn't lettuce. It's um, kalaloo, which is kind of like spinach. And then you can see it's, um, it's like a mixed vegetable mix up at the top. So we try to, as much as possible, get them to eat what is typical food for Jamaicans. Um, unfortunately, the last couple of years, there have be, has become um, a greater prevalence of American food in Mandeville area. So I'm finding that some of our students rely more and more on what they're used to eating rather than putting themselves into the experience of trying new. So I'm, I'm thinking on that, how I'm gonna resolve that issue. And then the lower left, um, this, this gal here, she had a bad day. She, she found out she was pregnant a couple of weeks before we went to Jamaica, and her doctor said, go anyway. And so um, 
she had a bad day at school. She got stung by, a, by their version of a yellow jacket. And, uh, you know, you think, well, it's a bee sting. You can handle it. But when you're in a foreign country and you don't know how you're going to respond and they don't have a first aid kit at the school and you and your partners have forgotten the first aid kit that you're told to always bring with you to the school, so you've got that natural consequence, it can lead for a really stressful and hard day. So what, what do you do when you're stressed out? You go get a manicure, right? So we found a, a local shop. Um, and uh, this, the gal that's doing the manicure, I actually go back to her to this day. That was about six years ago, probably. So, so um, you know, those experiences then allow the students to start talking to normal, everyday people of the community and to build friendships um, and to keep up those relationships over time. So one of the most important things that occurs is that my students are working on teaching. So they're spending all day, every day, with their cooperating teacher in a classroom. And um, this heightens everything that they learn in student teaching in the United States. It's heightened when you're over there. Because again, they're struggling with the language. They're struggling with the fact that the classrooms are a lot noisier. They're a lot more crowded, they have fewer resources available right in the classroom to use, so they really have to start being creative and stretching themselves. And again, this is where we really start seeing that, that shift from I'm better than you to we do things differently to um, maybe I need to start asking some questions. Uh, a good example of this uh, happened a few years ago. I had a couple students come back and say, we have to tell you something. We can't go back to the classroom. I said, why can't you go back to your classroom? She goes, the student said, um, well, the, the teacher keeps sitting at her desk, and then she bends down and pulls out rubbing alcohol and smells it. And I don't know why she, she's doing this. So this is, is she drinking this? Is it really alcohol that's in there? You know, they're jumping to judgment of this is a problematic situation. And um, I mean, it was, it was really fascinating to, to see their reaction and then help coach them through how they need to find somebody that they're comfortable with that they can ask about this. Because maybe it's a problem, maybe it's not. But if they assume it's a problem, they could be creating a bigger problem, not just for them, but for students that come in the future with me. And what they found by going to one of the teachers at the, um, at the college where we stay that they felt comfortable with, they learned that you know, just as we have natural medicine and um, like medicinal tips that are, brought, that are passed down from generation to generation, they do as well in Jamaica. And this teacher was catching a cold, and so, in her culture, if you sniffed alcohol every hour, that would somehow sterilize and get rid of the cold before it started. But not having asked that, they would have gone to the principal and created all sorts of problems for this teacher, and the teacher was really doing nothing wrong within her culture at all. And I don't know, I haven't tried it, but maybe it's successful. <laughs> maybe we need to try that here a little bit uh, recently. Okay, so, so they really are immersed in honing their pedagogy and realizing that things that they did in America that were really successful didn't quite work in Jamaica. So they learn about um, working harder to, to establish rapport with students and uh, figuring out ways that they can do that to develop those relationships. Um, they, they learn instructional skills. They realize that they don't need to have a... Um, uh, every child have iPads or have a computer in the classroom or have a projector system in order to be an effective teacher. They can be an effective teacher by what they own within themselves. And I think that that's really empowering for them. So they develop an awareness of curriculum and the importance of developed curriculum and curriculum um, uh, guides and standards. Um, they learn about behavior management there are many differences to how the Jamaican uh, culture and community works, and they're in a transition. When I first started bringing students to Jamaica, it was still legal for teachers to, hit, to strike kids. So we had to be very careful in the cl about the classrooms where our students were placed because um, the, the agreement was we would come into the school, but my students were not going to be put in a position where they were hitting kids or being asked to hit kids. Um, now it's illegal for teachers to strike kids, but it still happens here and there. Um, so 
it provides, though, a fantastic reason for us to pause and start thinking about why um, gently saying to the student, you know, please go back to your seat isn't going to work as well as taking the child by the hand and walking with them and saying, we need to sit in our seat now. Um, there's often, almost every trip, probably every trip, there are a couple incidences where our students think that there's been child abuse that have, that's happened. But after, again, we process through talking what exactly did they see, they come to realize that they didn't see abuse. They saw a teacher that's more physical. The teacher didn't hit the child. The teacher, you know, might have, you know, gone up to the child and, and it might have been, it might have actually been in praise and grabbed the child by the shoulder and said, good job, you know. But we're taught here not to touch kids at all. So any sort of physical contact uh, by our students is perceived as something threatening to the child unless we really pick it apart to determine really was this something that was negative or is it really something that's, that's different culturally. Okay. So they really work on refining their beliefs about teaching and their beliefs about um, pedagogy um, and their philosophy of what should go on within their classrooms. So they learn things like the importance of culturally relevant pedagogy. You see up on the, the left upper part, um, Melissa is teaching, it's actually a math lesson. It's a lesson on symmetry, but she's actually using the state fruit, which is an, a key, which is the thing with the black dots in the middle of the picture. Um, she's using that as an example for symmetry. Um, you see that we make sure that we have books that have brown-skinned children because these children all have brown skin. Uh, the PE teachers try to take games that the Jamaican children know and engage them with that within PE. They also take American games and they analyze what would be the um, pieces or the directions of the games that these kids wouldn't understand? One game is builders and, what is it, builders and bulldozers. I can't remember if that's the American name or if that's the Jamaican name now. But um, they had to switch the game around a little bit with the directions because a lot of the kids hadn't, it must have been bulldozers, a lot of the kids had never seen a bulldozer. They had no idea what it was. So that didn't, that didn't work in explaining the game. Um, and in the center, that's a parachute game that's going on. But, you know, again, we're in Jamaica. We don't have a lot of resources. They're using a sheet from a bed instead. So, so they really learn to, to look at what's in their environment and say, how can I use something differently? What's a different use for, for something that's readily available, not just to me right now, but to the teachers? Because part of this trip is about my students opening their minds, but part of this trip is also about them giving the gift to Jamaican teachers for, of having new ideas of active learning for their students. So we wanna make sure that whatever we're, um, we're doing in the classrooms, if there's materials that are required, those are easily obtained within the community. So here's some other examples. So we see another sheet activity with, uh, with little balls. Um, you see in the upper left, they're using bottle caps as counters for math. I mean, it's free. It's a, you know, it's right there. They have them anyway. Uh, we've, we've got a situation where they, for a fraction wheel, the teacher, the student from America created the fraction wheels and left them there for the teacher to use later. And uh, we've got rocks that are being used as counters there on the, the lower right. Here's another example. Um, Plastic plates from Walmart. You know, I think I got, a, I got a bargain that year. I think I got packages of five for 20 cents after the 4th of July. That's why they're all blue. But um, they take these plates and they use them as dry erase boards because they don't have dry erase boards available over there. Uh, so you see a couple examples of that. You see on the upper right, it's being used as a Frisbee in a physical education class. You see um, Trey is down... Uh, kind of hidden behind with the, the kids holding the plates up, they're using them as response cards. So he's asking a question, and the students are writing the answer and then holding it up so he can see that every student understands the concept. And then we left them with the teacher so that she could use them. And then in the um, very lower right side, we've got another physical education class that's also working on literacy. You probably can't tell, but on those plates are um, the letters, the capital B, done with dotted lines, and the goal was that the students took a tennis ball, and by controlling the plate, 
they would have to roll the ball down the, um, the line for the bee and around to make the bee with the tennis ball. So they're working on fine motor skills while they're also working on representing uh, letters of the alphabet in a different way so that hopefully they will uh, learn it more effectively. Okay. So what we, what we see here in the end is that uh, the students come away with a good understanding of differentiation. That even in a, just as in an American school where you've got kids of variety levels in the classroom, the same happens in Jamaican schools. It might even be more exaggerated though, because again, only the kids with the most severe disabilities are being identified and given special ed services. So they have to be creative, they have to look at the content differently, they have to look at how they present the content in, uh, in a, a different way as well to meet the students needs they learn the power of active learning historically Jamaican education has been what we call sit and get kind of like what we're doing here a little bit where I'm up here talking and you're out there being the audience um, but one of the things that they my students learn is how responsive these kids are to being up and moving around to learn so really important lesson. And they also learn the impact of praise. I think that's one of the biggest gifts probably that we leave with some of these teachers in Jamaica, um, especially some of the older school teachers when they can see how their students respond to simple praise as opposed to having everything be a punitive situation. Um, it makes for a much happier classroom environment. And my students got to see the difference too. They got to see that, they get to see that you can, you can, um, have a behavioral expectation that's set based on punishment, or you can flip it and get the same behavioral responses based on asking for the appropriate behavior and praising it or rewarding that as well. So it's a very valuable lesson for them. So going back to the initial questions and using this, this scale of the four points, at the beginning, uh, observations and comments were things like, um, well, my behavior management's the way that it has to be. This is the right way. The really gentle, gentle support of what I call the early childhood type behavior management, um, or I call it kumbaya, where you know we're all going to feel good and it's all going to be cuddly and soft and loving, and that is fantastic. But um, there are other ways to do it. But at that stage, they weren't seeing it. The parochial stage, they say, well, this is the only way. These teachers are bad. When they, when they say to the students, you're gonna come in, you're gonna sit down right now, um, our students were perceiving that as something very negative and very inappropriate at the start, okay? Uh, moving into the ethnocentric stage, um, the acknowledgement. Well, I think that it all should be, we should be kind and gentle and have a soft voice, but I can acknowledge that this teacher came into the classroom and pointed out a couple kids and said, you will sit down right now and take out your book, and they immediately replied and, and complied. So they were able to say, well, there are these differences, um, but I still think my way is the better way, okay? So that was early on. By the end of the five weeks, after they're really getting to the point where they see that there are a lot of similarities in education, and there are differences, but the differences are there for a reason and it's okay. And uh, they really start shifting their perspective and really jumping up to levels three and four. This is one of my favorite school places. This is their um, field that they do physical education in. They do it with the cows and the goats, which I just think is amazing. And talk about cultural naivete. Um, many of the students will, when they go down there, strip off their shoes. I thought it was because being somebody living in Wisconsin, that they didn't want to get um, step in a cow pie with their shoes, that it'd be easier to wash their feet. And then uh, one of my favorite teachers kindly informed me, no, they just like to go barefoot. <laughs> okay, um, They're able to see how dedicated these teachers are. As we go through the experience, they learn how little these teachers are making. Um, it's really a labor of love and a passion that they have to work with these kids. So they're, they're able to really pick out, just like in America, we have master teachers that really were called to the profession um, and are phenomenal in their skill set. The same people exist in Jamaica as well. They just have to be open-minded to, to really start asking the questions, to see the rationale, and then things start clicking in. 
So by the end of the experience, it really happens that I don't think I've had anybody that has stayed at a level one or a two. Everybody has gone up to at least level three. So the synergetic stage, um, acknowledging that um, behavior man management in an American way could lead to behavior issues or management issues over there. Um, then they were able to see sometimes being explicit in your expectations is, is okay. And it's okay to tell kids directly what you want and not talk around, around issues and situations. And then they found that you could be explicit and then you can, you can praise compliance in the end. <coughs> Excuse me. And then many of them hit the, particip the participatory third culture stage. <laughs> and with this stage, they understand that, that when something comes up and it's different for them, they need to ask the questions. <coughs> so the example I give up there has to do with this is a real life situation. Some of the students became friends with a taxi driver. So they used the taxi driver all the time. And at one point in time, they were going someplace that was different than where they usually went, so they got charged more money. And they felt that they were taken advantage of by the taxi driver. And after we had a um, conversation, you know, again, debrief and think about it, they went back and asked the taxi driver, you know, a little bit more explicit questions, and they learned that they should ask how much it's going to cost before they get in the vehicle, because if it's a longer distance or more time in the vehicle, it is going to cost more money. Then it was the conversation, but he's our friend, and we took him out. We bought him a drink when he took us to the bar. And, uh, you know, I have to explain to them that although he took you to the, you took, you took him into the bar with you and bought him a drink, that's because you invited him and you, he was your guest, but he still has a business. He still has to run his business. So, um, again, few students, a few of them get up to the our way. Most of them make it at least to the um, synergetic my way and your way, and they both have a purpose. So I think the experience really uh, has played out better than I would have ever imagined as somebody coordinating it. Um, and I think that the students just... Um, they leave feeling like Jamaica's home. I, in this conference that I've been holding, I now have prior participants that come back and present at the conference every year. So it's not been a one time and that's it experience. They really do feel like this area is a second home to them and that they belong there and they're very well invested. Um, I actually had one student name her daughter a Jamaican term because she just wanted her, she was pregnant with her son when she went over there and felt like he got the Jamaican experience, so he, she named her daughter Irie, which means all right or okay, um, so that her daughter could also have a Jamaican experience of her own, which I thought was really sweet. So having students student teach in a place where they're very different from their, their um, familiar seems to have a phenomenal impact. One of the things that I would like to do in the future is I would like to take that cultural competence exam and send it out to past, past um, participants with some additional questions to see how they feel their experience in Jamaica and the, the pedagogy that they developed and the philosophies of behavior management, how that impacts them today in their, their practice and their work. Uh, but I haven't gotten to that part yet. But um, they really leave understanding that when somebody is different, instead of, instead of um, falling into the, oh, this is right and that's wrong, they understand that when they leave that they need to suspend that judgment. And that happens in the American classrooms as well. You know, when, when I worked, I taught in a classroom where I was the only Caucasian. And had I gone in there feeling that my way with my military child upbringing was the only way and I hadn't asked questions, I probably would have had a lot more problems than what I had. But um, I understood that I needed to ask questions from living, you know, four years of my childhood in a foreign country. So, uh, you know, when little Tony was um, being talked to about not having his, you know, his gym shoes for the fourth time and he's looking at his feet, I was able to say to him, why are you looking at your feet when I'm talking to you? Because in my family, 
if my dad, the colonel, was, was uh, talking to me and I, were looking at, I was looking at my feet, I would have been in a lot of trouble. Um, and he was able to tell me the sign of respect in my home is to look at your feet if, if somebody is talking to you and, and redirecting you. Um, they're able to do the same thing now because they've had similar experiences where they had to really figure out that, that um, the cue that they're getting might be, from an American standpoint, inappropriate behavior, but if they ask the question, they find out that there's a real legitimate value and purpose to what's going on with the child. So it's, it's just been an incredible experience. to sit. Okay, we have a time for a few questions if anybody would like to ask Dr. Stevens a question about her program in Jamaica. Any questions? We'll get our microphones all set up and then, oh, here we go. Okay, good. I'll go here and then back here, okay? Other than the Jamaican experience, do you have other countries that are involved in anything like this or do, do your students require, do you require students to have an international experience of some other kind if they don't have this one? That's a really good question. Um, it's not a requirement that they go abroad. Uh, we do have worked into our program where we try with their field experiences to give them an experience, say, in a larger community like uh, Beloit or Milwaukee, and then they'll have some field experiences that are more rural um, environments but we do have more programs. So my program is Jamaica. We also have an Ecuador program. That's a little different than mine. You know, it's similar in that it's a developing nation, but it's worked in conjunction with a, an organization in Ecuador. So there's the support that way. So while I work as a tour guide and, you know, house mom, whatever, as, as we start out, that doesn't happen with the Ecuador program. It's a different structure. We also have a program in uh, Mexico and um, that one is done in conjunction with the university there. We have a program, I go through, so Jamaica, Ecuador, Mexico. We have a program in, um, in Sweden as well. Uh, and that program is very, very popular as well. So in that program, they also are doing it in conjunction with an, a university. They take a university course while they're there. They live in the dorms with the Swedish college students and then they student teach in the schools. I wanna say that there's one more. Maybe that's it. I think that's, that's it for now. We also have study abroad programs where you can either spend a semester abroad um, before you get to student teaching or you can do a, um, a, a travel study course where you're taking a course and you're going with a faculty member over to say France and you know, meet, Maybe you're studying um, art and you're going to do you know, art museums in France and talk about that as well. I, of course, think my program's the best. <laughs> I, you know, I, think that, I think that as far as having a gradual release support model, I think that, um, that I like that about mine. You wouldn't need that in Sweden because Sweden is so much um, more similar to America and the way, way they've developed and how their transportation system works and how their society works. You wouldn't need to really have a gradual release model, but for going to a developing nation where walking out of the airport, if they don't know who to call and how to call, um, they're going to end up in the wrong part of, of uh, Jamaica in the end. Um, so the very different experiences. It's interesting to see who's drawn to what. It's like the students have an understanding of what they feel comfortable with. I kind of call mine the mini Peace Corps because it tends to be the adventuresome, really want to challenge myself sort of students. But the other programs I think have definitely have their merit and worth as well. At the time of the Olympics in Beijing, we visited the Great Wall twice. The one was in a, in a very controlled tourist situation. The other, other we wound up at the boundary of the park and were beaten to death by t-shirts, you know. So. And the other thing, my point is in a foreign country, they're negotiating is another deal. Yeah. You start out dividing by four and come up with a price eventually, you know. Exactly. Yeah, that, and that, that I think is a really powerful experience. You know, they're used to going into a store in America and just, you know, paying, paying the price, that's it. You don't, you don't 
question it. You don't worry about it. Um, if you do that in Jamaica, you're paying probably four times too much. You know, at least at least two times too much. If you can't barter it down to half the price, then you've probably gotten ripped off. You know, but but it takes a real backbone to feel comfortable enough to to stand up and and say no. Any other questions for Dr. Stevens? She'll be here for a few minutes if you want to chat with her uh, individually, but please join me in thanking Dr. Amy Stevens for her presentation today. Thank you. Thank you for coming.